Hello and welcome. Um, welcome to this evening's book launch. I'm Alison Kersky, I'm the Curator of Sculpture and Decorative Arts in the Cortal Gallery. And I am really, really proud to celebrate with you the launch of this wonderful publication by Dr. Elisa Sani. It is the, the product or the result of, in a way, many years' ambition to have such a catalog. And in the gallery, we are we're just thrilled that it sort of came to fruition. Many people along the way have contributed to the making of this gallery, of this gallery, of this catalog. Um, but I think it's appropriate first, really, to, to thank Elisa for her immaculate research, her, her splendid sort of know-how, her intense, passionate interest in the subject. And in so doing, she has, to use a sort of silly phrase that's often used today, but she's elevated the collection insofar as we knew, you know, in the, in the Courtauld Gallery, in the, in the visitors, knew of the collection. But through her impeccable research, she's unearthed all kinds of fascinating things about it which have concretely changed the way in which we present it. We selected objects based on her findings, for example, who would have thought that the Courtauld Gallery, whose most famous collections are, are its Impressionist paintings, um, also had connections with the, the Grand Ducal Medici collection through its Maiolica, um, who would have qualified the collection as one of the important five collections in London of Maiolica. And through this research and through the publication and through the, the sort of determined um, progress that, that Elisa has made in every archive and sort of through contacting every, everyone um, who knows anything about this subject, we have been able to reinterpret it. We've rephotographed the whole collection. We have conserved, had con uh, conservation students from West Dean as well as conservators uh, from London, who uh, know there's one here. Uh, work on the collection, every aspect of the collection. We've had um, analyses done of the collection. We have even had the great opportunity through the generosity of a supporter to enhance the collection and add a couple of very important pieces to it. So it's an endeavor that has really um, enabled this collection to be integrated into the displays of the Courtauld and to shine. and it sort of helped buttress the kind of arguments that I was always making about the collection. So thank you for that as well, making my job a bit easier to say, in fact, we do need a greater <coughs> presence for the Maiolica in the, in, the, in the displays. I'm sure there are many other things I, I want to say, but essentially you're here to listen to Elisa and to have a, hear a conversation between Professor Tim Wilson, um, chaired by uh, Professor Guido Berkini who is the professor of um, 16th century Southern Europe at the Courtauld, and thanks to who's, well, who's the perfect interlocutor for tonight because of his um, interest and in research in the Gonzaga patronage, in the court of Mantua, in um, the design and dec decorative arts of, of Giulio Romano. And so the unlikely sort of um, position of Maiolica in, in the Courtauld is, is elevated through, through our conversation, will be elevated through our conversation tonight. And I just um, want to invite him to start. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll just say, I've, well, I've been introduced at this point. I'm Guido Rebecchini, and I teach Renaissance art up here. Um, I want to just to explain how today is going to work. We are um, following introductions. Elisa will uh, present a research on, on for for this uh, for this. Um, an important catalog that really transforms our collection uh, in, in many ways, as Sasha said. And she will speak about it. And then um, uh, there will be a conversation between Elisa Bailey and Professor Tim Wilson that will um, enable us to learn further about the complexities and richness of this project, of this publication, and of Maiolica studies more in general. And then there will be time for questions at the end. So, it is a great pleasure and a real privilege to introduce the author of this magnificent catalog, Elisa Sani, and to welcome Professor Timothy Wilson to this book launch today. 
Elisa is a researcher and a curator and a world-leading scholar in this field. She studied at Perugia and Siena, where, where many maiolias were produced, <laughs> and uh, universities, and has held curatorial positions at the Wallace Collection, at the BNA, and has been a researcher, a fellow at the court of, uh, over the period of this research. She has published a vast number of articles, and in, uh, I'd like to uh, remind us that in 2012, she published an, an important book, I think, entitled Italian Renaissance Maiolica at, at, for the VNA. A book that I think has had an important role in kind of presenting these uh, materials, these objects, to a wide public. And here I'm speaking as a teacher, and so I'm interested in the dissemination of the deep knowledge that she has accumulated over the years. And she's currently engaged in writing more catalogs and more in conducting more research into uh, other collections, including the collection, the Rothschild collection of Italian Maiolica. Uh, so um, someone who's deeply engaged over many years uh, in this ongoing study of these materials. It is also it is difficult to begin to summarize what uh, Professor Timothy Wilson has done for this field in his career, and I can just say a few things. He is a honorary curator in the Department of Western Art at the Ashmolean Museum, of which he was a keeper, the keeper until 2017. He's published uh, since the 1980s on Italian Maiolica, and. <laughs> Just, I can't list his uh, contributions, just to say that he's published the Italian Maiolica collection for the British Museum, the Metropolitan Museum, and uh, the National Gallery of Art of Washington. And I think this is just uh, enough to give a sense of the magnitude of his contribution. And in 2017, uh, is, is published a monumental work that contains a discussion of the co Italian collection of Maiolica in the Ashmolean Museum itself, but that goes well beyond Italy uh, to include Europe, and especially interesting for me, uh, Spain, Islamic Spain, where um, much of this story has started. But without further ado, I think we can now listen, as we can invite Elisa to come here to the podium and give her a presentation and join me in welcoming her here. Thank you, Sasha, and thank you, Rio. You've been too kind, you know. <laughs> lovely, lovely introduction. So, uh, I obviously I have a very short time to talk about, you know, a, a work that's in, you know, involved many years of of my, you know, my life, but I will try to do my best and summarize everything in less than for 25 minutes <laughs> of this. And um, uh, I, I have uh, three saints, three images of saints on the screen, uh, in a way because who has not said like St. Catherine of Alexander in front of 50 philosophers while producing the, less, the last uh, piece of a book. I think we can all share a bit of you know, the pain, the pleasure that you know you always will uh, proceed the publication of a book. But it's also I have this lovely images there to um, reveal really the like a thread, a golden thread in a way that goes from ground uh, gold ground paintings onto lacerware, and the thread is really that left by Thomas Gambifari who collected. The, the Maiolica in the Courton, and his strong taste and uh, individuality uh, and passion um, really reveal the, as his best inequality of the PCC he, he, he collected. Um, the, so we, we move from ground, uh, gold ground paintings, as I said, to uh, is Maiolica, and we see often the similar images of, uh, of saints. Uh, we have uh, also, uh, I want to show one piece that actually is no longer in the collection, and it's a small uh, round uh, lacerate in uh, St. Catherine of Alexander, who is, uh, was sold from the collection in 1920, 
And that um, had, uh, ended up in a collection that I have with Tim Wilson in 2007 uh, in Perugia, which is my hometown, which is really extraordinary to have that, <laughs> and be able to found that. But I see how it fits beautifully with the rest of the collection. Uh, the, the other uh, missing link really is the, the art the, of the collector, Thomas Gambiapari. He was a Victorian uh, uh, collector, uh, artist, traveler, is, but he was really uh, an artist. And he was uh, just an amateur sort of watercolorist. He was working on grand scale on mural decoration of religious spaces, and he was certainly not scared of heights because he decorated the nave roof of Ili Cathedral and also the octagon of Ili Cathedral, the medieval um, the lantern, um, which is really spectacular to see. He was lover of color and, and obviously it's revealed by his uh, um, really uh, love for. Um, I'm trying to adapt the, the, the works, the medieval works he loved to the, the climate of uh, England by creating an innovative system, not just the spirit fresco which he used often, but also other ones um, with natural resin and wax and turpentine, very inflammable uh, techniques in order to uh, have the brightest possible colors. His, uh, uh, his house, his stately home in Hainan, just outside Gloucester, was filled with works of art that now we see hanging in the walls of the portal. His uh, love really for uh, 14th and 15th Tuscan art and central Italian art really shines through. Uh, we have an image of some of the works that uh, were, uh, as they were displayed in the, in, in the home in Hainan court. And even more interesting, we have some of the Magliolica that was displayed there in the same room in the drawing room in a bit slightly later picture, uh, in, in, in which we can see our different works of art in the glass from the Islamic metal, metal work, the Magliolica were displayed in the room, also on tables and alongside all the paintings which were the core of the collection, the larger amount of the collection. For a collector of medieval uh, painting, mainly uh, uh, 14th century painting, it's perhaps surprising that there isn't a piece of medieval Majolica <coughs> in the collection. And sometimes, I, this is something I did not put in the catalog, but when I, whenever I look at this lovely uh, small nativity by Giovanni Baronzio in the Curto, who came from his collection, I cannot help by thinking that perhaps under the nativity, baby Jesus being um, having his first bath being washed by the midwives might have been being washed in a Magliolica bowl. <laughs> and uh, obviously, uh, if it was existing, it would be the largest Magliolica in existence. But we know that not very far from where Giovanni Baronzio was working in Rimini, that's one of the most realistic representations of a cake of medieval Magliolica in Tolentino in which uh, we see mon monumental large uh, olla or large jars being obviously reproduced in much detail and, they were, and of the time that it was existing. So perhaps, who knows, perhaps Gambiapari thought that it was a piece of Majolica and <laughs> it might have been there. But even if he, um, even if he wanted medieval Majolica, he could not have really understood what, what, what uh, 15 Majolica really was. It was not collected in Victorian times. We're talking about the uh, simply decorated green and brown um, Majolica, or the, the we call it cave Majolica. And uh, it was just simply not uh, possible to, um, to collect it because it, was, it survives on the ground. And so obviously it wasn't, you know, the excavations were not started at the, at the time which he was collecting, which is from the 1840s to the 1860s. However, his, his earliest piece uh, is a 15th century piece. So it shows sort of a, an individual uh, taste for um, the sort of early Majolica, as, as his time, this would have been the earliest Majolica known, when he collected this vase, which is the first piece in the catalogue. 
And this is uh, really well described by John Mallet in his essay for the catalogue between art and artifacts, saying that um, if the origin of this vase, um, a disputable vase, is not certain for, um, for sure, we certainly know that its decoration uh, with the Aflen busts uh, of a couple uh, uh, make us sure that it was a piece made for uh, perhaps a couple, like a loving cup. And uh, this cycle, Mallorca was uh, with this uh, with this type of decorations, well, particularly uh, so after our uh, collector. Uh, also, the other attraction, I think, was the fact, the shape. The shape is really what um, appears often in paintings with the Annunciation, the double and double bars. <coughs> which contains the flowers, the lily of the Virgin and the Annunciation. And this is the subject that Gambia Pari particularly loved. And he painted it in his church in Heinem that um, he uh, built in his estate. So you can see from the image on the top where there's a very elaborate vase in front of the Virgin with the flowers. But also he collected several Annunciations and the several Le Courto, thanks to Gambia Pari. So um, the bus, the surrounding bus was a shape that he was particularly fond of, and uh, this, um, I think finding this would have, you know, have been a, a great day for Gambi Pari to find this, this uh, type of, uh, of bars. And um, see other pieces from the collection show similarity for that similar sort of iconography of the portrait, uh, this metal like. Um, uh, slightly uh, arcane looking uh, vision and from that we can expect from a collector of 15th century paintings. For example, the beautiful Albarello from the Ruta with uh, uh, um, the girl in profile with, with elaborate headdress has really that um, really can, could be taken from a painting, a 15th century painting such as Botticelli or perhaps a near home to the Ruta to Pinturicchio. And uh, this type of, uh, of, of images, um, they were particularly appreciated by the painter. In fact, uh, it, we, we see it also on Tarsia, which is this wonderful ball, part of a large series of, pro, of, of Belladonna in profile with a scroll, which um, he often considered this type of wares as um, given as love gifts, or perhaps representing girls about to be married. But somehow there's something, the hardness of the headdress, it looks a bit like a parade armor, and uh, the aggressive mask on the top of the, her head, perhaps tells me that there's something a bit more, <laughs> she's not prepared herself to get married, it's perhaps she's out there to go to a pageant bar, ball, or mask or a carnival. And uh, despite the fact that those type of uh, belladonna, as we call it, were painted from the 1520s, um, the, the fact that they, uh, were, they were presented in profile is not seen, is, we should not consider it as a sort of uh, um, being backwards from, from the potters, something looking at, at, at the art of the previous century, because we, we, if we think of Michelangelo in the 1520s and 30s, he was sort of experimenting with ideal heads in cells and profile, with very elaborate headdresses as well. So I think that the, the Noyolica potters were working in, in this style, were actually pioneers in, the, in, the, in those sort of representations as well. And the, the collection is full of functional um, but superb vases, really. There's, um, there's really an interest on quite a lot of uh, this uh, pharmacy jars, there's uh, more than in other collections, and uh, it's, we can see the, the style that obviously appealed to the collector, often with busts of women that we see again, or three quarter women with uh, more updated outfits now that. Uh, in those jars, for example, made in Abruzzo and Castelli in the 1550s. And uh, 
we can admire also the shapes that really at this in place in the second part of the century to become really more, much more elaborate and the very distinctive dragon handle, pharmacy jars for example, and also the very elaborate writing, the Gothic writing with the, with the written with a brush in which we we read the the content of the of, of the pharmacy jars. It is actually quite interesting that the same sort of a, a, a pretty and pleasant images are used for, <coughs> for example, for <coughs> apple syrup. But at the same time, they can be used for very important medicines, such as that they contain what they was meant to contain the cap jar, which is uh, an antidote uh, was used as an antidote to for women uh, after giving birth. It was used to expel the placenta, and also it was a particular strong and uh, quite a, a potentially life-saving remedy. We have um, um, also a very interesting group of lusterware, which is uh, particularly beautiful. And I've just chosen one, which has a unique design, is uh, one of the magi, and is this beautiful uh, imagery, elegant, this elegant youth. She's sort of just about to step out from uh, a painting, but in fact it is, is derived from a fresco by Perugino, and it's, um, it's just, um, it's sort of a, not, not just another coincidence, but it is um, a wonderful uh, fact, the fact that Gambiapari loved Perugino, he was his favorite painter. So even if at the time he didn't know that this was deriving from a painting, uh, from the fresco of Perugino, still is uh, so, he would have been so happy to know <laughs> that uh, that was the case. You see how the Deruta Potter has just taken one figure and then placed it in the background that he was quite off the news, the tide floor with his scroll uh, against him. And uh, it's, um, the diaries of Gambifari always mentions how he does everything, takes trains, he walks in, in order to go and find Perugino paintings. So perhaps he did at some point saw it. And in fact, he, the, he decorated uh, the neighbor from the Ely Cathedral with an image which I think has something of the one of the nativities of Perugino, if not this one, one of the many they produce. And in having the Virgin at the center, on one side the Magi, on the other one the Shepherds. Uh, what is perhaps amusing is the baby, which is in the Renaissance paintings, is completely naked because obviously the stress was on having a healthy baby and the boy, baby boy in that case. But the Victorian version, rather more prudish, is completely covered. The baby is completely is and. Uh, yeah, let's breathe for a second on the origin <laughs> I get some water. Beat the Umbrian hair for a second. And then a little bit of drafty uh, stable, but uh, this lovely landscape with the you know, the, the Lake Trasimeno, actually you can see from, from, from Città della Pieve, which is beautiful. One of the, one of the uh, original things about the Gambifari collection was the fact that he lacks completely um, historiato or figures or stories, um, or with stories and figures uh, from classical tales. There's nothing from the metamorphosis, uh, so no transformations, no tales from, from about gods and nymphs. All of the Magliolica in his collection is what we could call uh, Counter-Reformation Magliolica. They're all religious Magliolica, and they were all made in the second part of the 16th century. So there's no lack, there's a complete lack of the famous names of Magliolica, such as Nicola da Rubino, or Santo Avelli, or uh, Maestro Giorgio da Gubbio. But still, in the second part of the century, there were workshops working in Urbino, which they really worked at a late, I mean, the very, very high level. And one of them was the famous Fontana workshop. 
Uh, then this is clearly visible about this masterpiece in the collection. It's high on, on a ball, on high foot. It's decorated on both sides with a scene which often, you know, you, you don't, would, would not find on tableware. It's quite rare on Majorica. Um, we might imagine this dish not being used at the table, but more likely being perhaps used for liturgical purposes. But it's so beautifully painted. And it makes us um, think about what Pico Passo, who wrote the three books of the Pot and Sart around this time when this dish was made, around 1557, how, how in detail was his description about painting and how many recipes he gives for the colors and all the instruction he provides for painting rocks and grass and uh, skin. And you can see on the level all the different variety of colors that they are really um, incredible in this. Pico Passo also tells us how to make brushes, and he recommends to use those made of hair of goats, and also those ma made of the mane of asses. But the best ones for his Suriato, he recommends the whiskers of mice, <laughs> and those around the mouth. So I <laughs> sometimes <laughs> think of young assistant potter and to go around the workshop to look for mice to, to make the brushes. And apparently they're, they're expressly made for historiati, so for this stuff. So perhaps one of the species were made <laughs> with these. Um, so, um, yeah, perhaps I made a bit of a daring <laughs> comparison, but just, just a quick um, mention of Rubino at this time when the second part of the 16th century is certainly not a uh, time of decline, artistically decline. We know that um, Titian and Bronzino, and then artists such as Battista Franco, uh, the, 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 the Zuccheri brothers were there. They were all making drawings and designs for Mallorca, and also it was the cradle of uh, you know, Federico Barocci, the street of you know, counter-reformation of Mannerist artists from Urbino, and this year is going to be a big exhibition of Barocci in Urbino at the Galleria Nazionale. And uh, I, uh, I grew up looking at this very large altarpiece in the cathedral in Perugia, my own town, and I sometimes think that it, you know, this miniature in Maiolica were just a little bit part of the same you know, artistic sort of uh, uh, confraternita <laughs> in, in Urbino. Um, it's actually, the crucifixion is actually not taken from the drawing by Batista Franco or um, by the Zuccheri brothers. It's taken from a very postage stamp image uh, of uh, one of the Bible books that was so popular, uh, so popularly printed in, in the second part of the 16th century. And it's all the details are there, and it's incredible how the artists have made this completely different. Know, elaborate and beautiful version just from them. And all of the Mallorca in the Gandhi collection comes deriving from the Sleeper Bible books. They become a very important source. So the Snow Raphael prints <laughs> and uh, the school, but it's mainly this. And this is another example. I just love how this um, rendition of the, the crossing of the Red Sea in which the, the painter, which is a fine supporter, and it's one of the only, the only signature we have in the Gambia Pari collection of the potter, um, he has used the swirling vertical waves that is in the print, in the very small print from the BBC story, which is even earlier there, and even more sort of arcade looking <laughs> um, scene into this very lively image. And that signature. So we have signature, we have writing in Italian, in Bulgarian, uh, about describing the scene. And this is uh, very innovative from Majorica painters. We don't find this in paintings. Very few people could read and write. And some Majorica painters obviously were able to even write verses. And, 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 and also, they were um, establishing a very important fact. They were the first potters since antiquity to sign their work, and actually giving us the first pottery marks in existence with the uh, ability and showing how the quality was, you know, had reached the heights of the, the, the classical civilization. So um, 
I don't want to spend too much time on the collection, but I just want to mention a few other pieces that are included in the Gandhi Pari collection. And uh, it did include German Stormer, for example. It also included Delft, Dutch Delft. It was all sold. It was not included in the bequest, unfortunately, which was rather recorded in 1966. Luckily, this beautiful lead glazed uh, puzzle jug arrived, stayed, and it's a wonderful really work. It's not made of Majorica, it has incised and uh, carved and molded work, and it's a beautiful <coughs> object. There were also some pieces, four pieces of Spanish lusterware, all the 16th and 17th century, that um, were much, much appreciated by the collector. This is wonderful large molded dish, uh, which has a coil in relief, which is making it really quite spectacular. And um, Gandhipa really loved this collection of lusterware as far as to reproduce one of his Spanish vases, flower vases, in one of his paintings. And this, uh, you will find this altarpiece that he painted um, in the 1870s, is in the shop of Tewkesbury Abbey. I was so grateful that the vicar has taken up all the knickknacks they normally cover uh, where the, this painting is and uh, also Tewkesbury Abbey is completely surrounded by floods all the time in the climate. And so you can see that the techniques that can be very used are very durable and <laughs> the colors are still very bright. It's so lovely. In the corner of the Last Supper, he has added there that it could not be his own bars. Nice detail. And there's also four pieces, five actually pieces of Iznik. And he was very proud of his purchases because he said, I bought them a lot long before all the rage about them. And obviously, he's, uh, he must have bought them in the 1850s and early 60s. And they are all visually stunning, this lovely blue and white and uh, green dish, which belongs to the time that precedes the, the use of the sealing wax, the red wax, which is so typical of Iznik. So it's much, much uh, sort of verified with the, the white tulips. And the lovely uh, emerald green jug with a stunning scale of decoration and a Victorian mount as well. They're just very beautiful pieces and great eye, great style. Um, we have ties, we have only three ties, but there are three ties, two ties that two, I mean two that belong to the same payment, but they belong to the most sort of celebrated artistic private spaces of the Renaissance. One is two black ties, one is dated 1509 from the Petrucci Palace, which uh, from the Camarabella of the Petrucci Pass, which was fitted out by Pandolfo Petrucci for his son Borghese and Mary Victoria Piccolomi, which is all decorated by the most famous artists of the time, and the ceiling and all the details were, um, uh, you know, to the minimal detail, were well imitating classical Roman uh, wall decoration. And the other one is a recent addition to the collection and it's presented by some fog. And it's one of the ties uh, with Gonzaga emblems that decorated the studio of Isabella d'Este. And uh, I must say that at the court of the Petrucci Palace, uh, tile is dated. It's quite rare. The rest of the paint is at the VNA. And then now, with this design, the sunburst, which is missing in Great Britain, all of the different design of the, the Gonzaga payment are present in England, so just incredible <laughs> complete to that and how lucky we are to have wonderful Majorica collections. So this is the end. <laughs> I have to end with how you know our, our, one of our favorite pieces, I have to say, is Sasha, this very damaged. Uh, oak leaf jar, it's a mystery jar, because unfortunately the scroll is missed, some of the ones are missing. So we, you know, we spend time with conservators, so we're steam to conserve it. I spent time with some Latin scholars to try to understand what was written in the jar. The jar is missed, the sandal, at some point was lost from the collection, <laughs> was conserved by different people, 
And Oli Wiesner has been of inspiration to a wonderful ceramic artist to produce a beautiful echo in jar, uh, Catherine Moy, you see her tonight. And uh, as um, he was part of a, a menopause in Maiolica display, which he was to place, you know, just last week I collect. So now I pause. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Now I would invite you and Timothy Wilson to come to the table and and um, we can continue the com conversation or rather start a conversation. Uh, thank you very much, Elisa, for your presentation. Before we launch into this discussion, I would like to kick off this conversation with a consideration on the, which seems to be fitting this place as a, as a education place. Um, and, and note how interdisciplinary is the study of Maiolica, um, which Elisa describes very well in her foreword, which I'm going to quote a like, few lines because I think they say perfectly well what I'm meaning to, to, to highlight here. Researching for a Maiolica catalogue, Elisa writes, is particularly complicated because there are so many aspects to take into account which is a very honest and transparent uh, assessment of the task. From heraldry to print sources and early printed books, the history of pharmacies and early medicine, food and table manners, politics, classical and modern history and mythology, as well as geography, not to mention a grasp of a number of languages, of the history of fashion, and collecting history and art sales. Which is already it's like spinning <laughs> me, my head and uh, spin, um, and this does not, of course, include uh, the, the a detailed knowledge of the manufacturing of Maiolica and its uh, technical um, aspect, and also of the terminology, which is not familiar <laughs> to everyone. From my perspective as a teacher, Maiolica offers a fantastic. Um, avenue for asking a vast range of critical questions to engage students at different levels of their education and who do not generally possess any specialist knowledge of Maiolica. Uh, questions that um, engage them in thinking critically about these objects, starting from these uh, exceptional objects, and to think about things like issues of sociability. How do we get together around these objects? mobility, for instance, of artistic ideas, techniques, and motifs. How, how come that we find this uh, transposition of models from one city to another, from one country to another, and across, uh, across um, the seas? Uh, so issues of, as we say, cross-cultural exchange. This catalog, and here again I'm speaking as a teacher, will enable students to explore unfamiliar objects, mostly, with a new level of awareness and to direct their attentions to objects that are utterly fascinating. And for this, I'm very grateful <laughs> to your work because they really add to my, uh, the list of my tasks an entire uh, range of new objects. So I would like now to start the conversation by asking a set of questions that uh, um, Professor Timothy Wilson and Elisa um, hopefully can um, shed light on. And one of the recurring questions of the lay public when confronted with these splendid objects is a very uh, kind of naively perhaps, but how they were used, or were they used at all, or only uh, put on display as, as, as luxury objects. Can you tell us uh, how do we answer this question? How do we assess use? And what do you look in these objects to, uh, as traces of potential usage of these, um, of these materials? 
more broadly, one can say, how do we reconnect form, this beautiful form that you have shown us, and functions? Is that perhaps a question that, a, a series of questions that we can, you can start to discuss? And one of the things, do I need to be a bit closer to that? Uh, one of the things about the Gambier Parry collection is the great variety of shapes. If you contrast it with the much bigger collections of the VNA or the BM or the Wallace collection, they are overwhelmingly plates, things seen and collected very much as a kind of painting um, and flat. Um, and very often in the 18th and 19th century, things were framed up to put on the walls. And sometimes they, when you take them out of their frame, you find they've been horribly cut down to fit the frame. But Gambier Parry clearly liked form, and so that has meant that Elisa has addressed, as she has in her previous work, the question of, of function very much, um, and very interestingly. Um, and I'm sure that he was thinking about the display possibilities of things in a rather crowded study um, when, when, when collecting things. Um, <coughs> The business question of how much these things were used is something one can quite easily go on for several evenings about. <laughs> um, it's worth remembering that Majorca, even at its grandest, and though it had some very grand patrons from the nobility to the high clergy down to the prosperous bourgeoisie, was never as expensive as silver. On the other hand, it was never too good to use um, at any point. And it was also, incidentally, cheaper than Chinese porcelain, as Chinese porcelain tended to come in. And that, for example, was clearly regularly used uh, on the tables of the Ferraris and, and Medici rulers. Um, the most eloquent document about this, I think, is the um, now celebrated letter discovered not so very long ago in the Mantuan archives, which is a letter from Eleonora, Duchess of Urbino, to her mum, who was no less a person than Isabella d'Este, the prima donna of the Renaissance. And she says, um, I wanted to have some problems. She's writing from Pesaro, which is part of the, the state of, of Urbino. She says, I wanted to send you some produce of this country, but things the produce was out of season. So instead, I've had set, had made a set of earthenware vessels since the masters of this country have a reputation for good work. Um, and you will be able to use it at Porto. Porto, as Guido knows a hundred times better than I do, is Porto Mantovano, um, which is Isabella's uh, country villa outside Mantua. Um, because it is a cosa da villa. I think that's a wonderful phrase. It's a country villa thing. Um, and my own view about this, and Guido has been spent much more time in archives than I have, may tell me I'm wrong, but I think that Isabella, when on duty at court functions in Mantua, would have been required as the wife of the head of state, or the widow of the head of state, um, to eat off silver and gold. But take her out to the country, to Porto Mantovano, where there are literary people and um, where there are musicians in particular, um, and where we know from the novelist Bandello, who went out there um, at one point, that subjects from classical mythology, for example, could provide starting points for elegant conversation. And for instance, Bandello describes a conversation about whether Lucretia had been right to commit suicide after she'd been raped. Um, and you can absolutely imagine a Maiolica plate being the starting point for an after-dinner conversation like that. Um, and so these things are cosi da villa, and it's, it's quite clear that at the highest level of society, uh, and particularly women, um, would have these things in the country um, rather than their military um, husbands in the cities um, demanding to, to show off their silver and gold. Um, and there was a very nice um, document, which I think the late Clifford Brown found for me, which again, Guido will know better than I do, um, which is I I Isabella's will. She leaves everything to her son, uh, Duke Federico, except for the villa at Porto, which she leaves 
to the future duchesses of Mantua pay il loro piacere e disporto for their pleasure and delight. So that's the context in which I think um, particularly in mythological Maiolica, though of course, as Elisa has very clearly told us, that's not ultimately Gambier Parry's thing, um, is a place for elegant, literary, often female-dominated um, society outside urban life. Um, and at that, at that level, um, it can hit the absolute peak of society, whether it's popes or princes. Yes, actually, Pope, uh, no, which we shall mention that uh, Clement VII, he, 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 was, um, he was asked by an agent of Eleonora a bit later in the 15, in 1530s if, if the agent saw the Pope eating off uh, white dishes, white on white dishes. And he seemed to have been surprised by this, and he asked, but, your, 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 your Majesty, you can't say that. Your yeah, holiness, holiness. Your Holiness. Why don't you use historiato? And he replied that he only used them when he was eating out with cardinals. So obviously the cardinals particularly liked eating off you know, historiato by your. <laughs> John. I'm, I'm curious here to um, ask whether you can see traces of use. Mm -hmm. Or on on the when you I mean you have such an experience of looking at the objects. I mean when we study Cassoni, we we yeah. like to see whether there was a key that <laughs> damaged the painting yeah. uh, just under the whole keyhole. But well, there's a lot of uh, mm. the use of the fork was not very widespread, and uh, up until. So obviously there was, hands were used a lot, so they were rinsed a lot, in fact, during courses. And so uh, the scratching of us uh, using knife and fork together is perhaps something which it was less common. Also the fact that the pieces that survived, obviously their doors perhaps were less used or just very occasional use. And the other ones that they were damaged were being scarred. I don't know what's your... Yeah, I mean, tin glaze, it you know, has to be made clear, is a very, very soft and vulnerable form of earthenware. Um, a piece of Staffordshire creamware of the 18th century will last a hundred times as many meals <laughs> as a plate of, t of tin glazed earthenware. And so it would show if they'd been extensively used, as it were, for main meals. Um, but I suspect, though I can't prove this, that they're very often used for a, a dessert course yeah. rather mm. than for, for, for a main meal. Um, <laughs> I've handled over the years, and John will have handled probably even more, um, a good many of the Isabella plates. And some of them are broken, but I've never seen one that is significantly worn or okay. abraded in the way that um, your, 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 your bog standard crockery is. Yeah. They use as fruit dishes as well, often for fruit. Can I ask you a related question, perhaps moving on from on another area that I think is maybe of general interest? And speaking of use, because use the usage of an artwork is a kind of on a, a paradox today. And um, use has become a category that has tended to exclude objects from the realm of the arts. Mm -hmm. Something that you use that is functional is uh, kind of, is, its status is diminished in the uh, kind of uh, more um, kind of common understanding of what an aesthetic, what, of the aesthetic pleasure that the artwork uh, provides the viewer with. So, um, can you help us understand how you reconcile this idea with the idea of the status of Maiolica, both originally and today? Because as you said, now Maiolica, or in recent time, modern time, Maiolica has been framed and hanged on, on the wall as a picture, as a painting. Um, can you help us to kind of measure the standing of Maiolica within a modern and possibly uh, an original standing, a uh, hierarchy of artworks. <laughs> Is that? Um, I 
hope you occasionally um, get your students who can read Italian to read the wonderful book by Ferdinando Bologna called Dal, um, Dalle Arte Decorative al Industrial Design, which has wonderful account in the Renaissance of the separation of the notions of art and craft in the 16th century. And the way I read it, that is the result of a very deliberate campaign by people, particularly in the circle of, of the Sari, to say that what an artist, a painter, um, to a lesser extent a sculptor, because they're disagreeably dusty, but painters and architects anyway, um, want to be seen as gentlemen. And they, so they, um, there is this notion, um, was it Michelangelo who's supposed to have said a man paints with his brain, not with his hands? Um, so there's a whole series of um, uh, quite conscious attempts to establish um, a hierarchy in which uh, painting and architecture, the arts of the mind, as it were, um, and the, uh, the arti del disegno, as, as Vasari would say, the creative arts, as we might still now say, um, are regarded as something different from um, hand-making things. You can see, I think, the beginnings of this idea from, from the late 15th century. Um, but the real crunch is whether if you had invited, there are lots of stories. There's this famous early 19th century German novel um, about Raphael painting um, on Maiolica dishes. Raphael, of course, from Urbino, the great center of Historiato Maiolica, at exactly the moment at which Urbino is becoming preeminent in painted Maiolica, supposedly um, painting on um, Maiolica dishes to, to, to impress the girls. Um, but, and there is a document in which Raphael is supposed to have done um, some painting on Maiolica. That document appears to be a fake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and in fact, the only um, example that I can cite at all of um, when a major painter um, worked um, apparently on Maiolica is a document that John Mallet found many years ago um, in which um, Pietro Aretino writes to, um, I think, Battista Franco, yeah. does he, saying, you know, and you taught him to paint Latte del Penello nei Vasi, which suggests that Battista Franco could, um, did his own painting. Um, I am somewhat doubtful of this. Um, the truth is, um, and we have potters here who can tell us, that painting on tin glaze is bloody difficult. Um, you need the confidence of the um, fresco painter, because you can't change stuff, with the minuteness of a miniature painter, and you need a lot of experience on how colours, which are which come out quite different when they've been fired, will come out and what balance they will have. Um, and I think it may not be too silly to say that Maiolica painting was actually too difficult for artists unless they've been specific, <laughs> specifically trained up to do it. Whether Raphael, I'm sure Michelangelo would have regarded it as an infra dig if somebody had suggested mm. that he paint on Maiolica, but whether Raphael or Perugino would have done, or whether it's just that they didn't know how to do it, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, one, oh, sorry. Uh, yes, I think Vasari is, is a, an interesting case here because uh, if you compare the first edition of his Lives of the Artists, uh, he writes about his own family. Vasari means potter, after all. And um, he uh, he's much shyer when he writes the second edition, only a few years later, about the the, the sort of um, artifacts that his, his ancestors had made. And I, I think that was because just at that moment he was trying to establish uh, an academy. And the, the academic tradition, which was, of course, taken up by Sir Joshua Reynolds later, who again was very careful to exclude the sort of minor artists, as he would consider, who decorated porcelain. And uh, Jeffreys Hammett O'Neill of the 18th century painted on Chelsea porcelain uh, never appears in, in, the, uh, in, in the academy. Uh, Carlini, who modeled figures, we think, for uh, 
uh, was the only serious artist who, uh, but he'd given up modeling porcelain figures by the time he was elected a sculptor to the yeah. Academy. So I think I tried to ha handle this a little bit in the introduction I wrote in the, um, to, to the catalog. And I think it's a fascinating case. And I think one of the key people is our friend uh, at, uh, the painter at Cafagiolo, um, yeah. what's he's called? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Who um, <coughs> did what I think is a self-portrait of himself sitting yeah. in front of two very smart uh, patrons and painting a dish. And uh, he himself is dressed in the smartest of paths you could imagine. It's in the DNA, right? And uh, I, I'm sure this was uh, the ideal, not the reality. He was hoping uh, just at this moment, in the very early 16th century, uh, to establish Majolica painting as an art. And I don't think he succeeded. Yeah. <laughs> Just staying, with, just staying with Vasari at the moment. Vasari does exactly the same, um, according to an article by Marco Coloreta, between um, the first and the second editions with metalwork. So, for instance, people like Verrocchio and Cellini um, are the notion that um, you progress in a hierarchy from being a goldsmith to being a sculptor is something that is developed between the two editions, I believe, of Vasari's lives. Absolutely. <laughs> Goldsmithry has enjoyed a, a high, a, such a high stand of status in the late 15th and then in early 16th century. <laughs> but then Vasari, uh, across the two, period, uh, the two editions, uh, changes the perspective. Um, conscious of time, I'd like to dedicate some time to questions, to curiosities, and observations and comments from. The audience. Can, I'd, I'd like to ask one thing, and particularly to Elisa and Sasha. Um, the, I mean, Gambia Parrot's love was clearly for medieval art. I mean, clearly, you know, he was you know, a very religious man, um, and so the faith theme um, is almost uniquely um, characteristic um, of this collection. But um, just at about the same time, and slightly earlier, we have Pugin. Um, I don't really know much about the relationship between Pugin and Gambier Parry. How well no, they know? It's very funny because I was going to ask you that question. <laughs> <laughs> because Pugin also, he dies and in 1852, admired, yeah. and in 1853 wow. there is a Pugin sale, and it has exactly the same mm -hmm. kind of Deruta lustre. Yeah. Now we think of these as Renaissance art, made in Deruta and for, for Perugian and Roman markets, 1520, mm -hmm. 1530. Pugin, of course, detested. Renaissance art in all its mm. manifestations, but somehow lusterware acquires a status, I think, in Pugin's mind, of kind of honorary medieval art. <laughs> yeah. um, and I wondered if... if, if I mean, if you make that point in the, in the collection, in the catalog, <coughs> that, you know, the lusterware, and, and you've made it here, so, you know, can be thought of as the equivalent, perhaps, in his mind, of world ground painting, with those kind of also calligraphic sort of lines and slightly a throwback to an earlier time. Yeah. It's certainly in his you know, in his love of, of um, uh, Gothic architecture, he must have, uh, you know, must have wanted to emulate or, or sort of Pugin. Certainly, in the design of his own church, at one point in a, a drawing, he he didn't design it, but he had a friend of his who was an architect designer at Woodyer, and he sort of crosses that and he goes higher, you know, spire higher. So he is really trying to be as Gothic pushing. as possible, pushing. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it is interesting that he. Yeah collects my look and that isn't a an obvious choice. Yes. Well certainly last aware there's no depth, there's no prosperity yeah. because Isuyato painters work so hard to make, you know, that that sort of try to three dimensional the perspective, but with Isuyato everything is flat. It's but it's not as though he goes from collecting lustreware to then progressing to historiato. Yeah. No. Right, he doesn't do yeah, that. Yeah, but I just mean of, for yeah. Pugin, you know, and Pugin. also some of the images that they were produced in Lustre were, were 15th century, mm. and they were certainly, you know, a bit backwards in the root at the time, and they were producing this beautiful Lustre, and the images that they were producing were those of 20, 30 years earlier. As, I mean, it wasn't so, they were not so up to date. They were a bit like or Perugino worked, you know, until very late in his own, repeating the same style. I think the Ruta Cotes is some, 
Well, it's, it's, it's a bit of an... A bit, I'll be rude to you as an, as an ombre now. It's a bit of a, an ombre thing now. I mean, yeah. Pinterickio shamelessly plagiarises Perugino, and then Perugino yeah. returns the compliment. And you know, yeah. So they're, they're, yeah. they're constantly, basically, using each other's designs yes. in, in, I think, a way that was probably annoying to both of them at some, some yeah. time. And Gabriel Perry had a... I mean, yeah. I mean, he did have a very sentimental sort of perspective on religion, on his... Yeah. on art. He, yeah. You know, so he... You know, so there is a sweetness to certain things he must have appreciated. Um, or, or, yeah. And also, I think he's not only one thing. You know, you can't sort of just say, oh, he's... Because he also must have, I mean, as, you, as you point out, the proliferation of shapes and forms, that it's not, you know, it's not, he's not only looking at sort of pictures, but he may perhaps, as a, as a person who, who, who was himself an artist, yeah. because, you know, it, it maybe also appreciated the kind of craftsmanship aspect of things. Oh, yeah. I only I say this because he also collected other non you know sec, non religious uh, works and had a really extraordinary small but very high quality collection of, of Islamic metalwork. So that doesn't fit in ideologically, but it's sort of beautiful things, beautifully made. Yeah. I'd just like to say that he was he was also an extraordinarily competent artist. Or it's yeah. almost exactly the time that he was um, doing the Heinem frescoes, um, the early pre-rafts were trying to decorate the ceiling of the Oxford Union building mm -hmm. in Oxford, and they too tried an experimental technique, and it is completely illegible. They were completely hopeless at it. Yes. He has an experimental yes. technique, and it still looks fabulous. Yes. Um, and anybody who's never been to Heinem Church, yes. strongly recommend it, yes. just, just north of Boston. <laughs> They're also the Palace of Westminster. They were tried the fresco decorations there in the eighteen thirties up to and they were all brown and grey, you know, and they were so very successful. And a lot later and other artists used the same technique and then he wrote a book about it. So yeah, it's great. Please. Yeah. Can I, can I sort of, um, On the medieval part. You go <laughs> Bit like a place here. Um, can I comment on the Cosa della Villa? Um, Marco Spallanzani, who's an economic historian, who has really published wonderful things based on inventories in Florence, uh, in, in his book on um, 17th century Ligurian Biolica, um, he has published a number of inventories which actually show what sort of things were kept where and how they moved about. And um, one of the things that's there is that uh, the lesser sons of um, the Medici, or offspring of the Medici, uh, if I remember right, um, he acquired a set of Savona for service, Maiolica, and then he moved it to his um, country villa. But in the palace, his apartment in town, he kept the porcelain and the silver. And um, also in other inventories, you see how the broken bits accumulate in the villas. We also have a case of a bishop, which rather presumably rules out the role of women. Um, his uh, Ligure in Maiolica was kept outside Rome in the countryside, but again, his metalwork was kept in the town. Um, basically, it's a question of security. You can leave the things that don't matter much or little value in the countryside, unless, of course, you want to be like English kings who sort of furnish every time they go to a palace and move. Um, the other thing that's also interesting about the inventories is one that's been published by Luciana Bace of uh, the Prince of Vasto, which is in the Abruzzo. I don't know if you know this article, Tim. But there, it's what, that's the beginning of the 18th century. There you see where all these things are kept. But he has a special room in his major palace. And there you have the framed Raphael with uh, other things uh, as well. But I'm sure you know more about those things than I do. 
Well, we have Suzanne Higgett here with us who read brilliantly about um, the history of framing yeah. Maiolica, which begins in, in the middle of the 17th century um, and stays in fashion um, until the 1830s and 40s. Thank you. Um, just to follow up, last point on that, of course in the 1830s and 40s when uh, dealers like Alessandro Forese were going out and rediscovering all the Maiolica that collectors were seeking, they often went out into the countryside, into the peasants' houses, and Forese writes about how the aristocrats, when they finished with this stuff, they'd hand it down to their estate workers, and they would actually often go into the these peasants' houses to find these amazing works. <laughs> well, don't underestimate the talent of dealers and mm -hmm. seeding things in apparently farmhouses. There's a question there, one there, and then Emma. Hmm? Thank you for that fantastic talk. Um, I was really interested in sort of the use and reuse of these um, beautiful pieces and the talk discussion a bit about how women see these in particular. I'm wondering about the pharmacy jars, uh, which are so beautiful. Um, do we see them being used by women working in that space, in the pharmacy space, in the apothecary space at all? And do we see them being, the, the manufacturing of them being marketed towards women at all or not? I don't know. Well, certainly we, are, we know women are having a great interest in remedies. Uh, there's, um, there's not inventories mentioning, for example, Lucrezia Borgia, when she was a duchess in Ferrara, how she would order medicines from Jerusalem, and the, me the medicines were also coming to Jerusalem from uh, Cairo and from, you know, um, great distances, precious medicines that were then collected by friar, by priests for her and taken to Venice. So when we look at the jars and they're so beautiful, we can imagine also one of the reasons was because the medicines inside were something extremely precious and obviously not everyone could afford to have you know, medicines taken from you know, the Middle East to, to them, but certainly the you know, they were obviously used, and, but certainly the cup jar with this, you know, almost unique content, uh, I don't know any other, we don't know any other jar with, that contains that particular remedy for, to be used for women after giving birth, with all the risks with connected with giving birth during the Renaissance, and certainly it's, uh, it's wonderful to have. Uh, so, you know, I questions of this all about use and function. I was reminded of um, ancient Greek um, bread finger pottery where they had the eyes on the bottom, you know, and you would lift it up drink and then you would become this sort of figure with a mask that had the eyes and the big nose that was the, um, the stand for the pot. So I was wondering if, if there was a similar sort of sense of um, on the one hand humor maybe not in the religious ones that were part of this collection, but um, in general in Maolica, but also to sort of extract from that a sense of um, the development of using a, a, a piece of Maolica pottery and um, experiencing as the, the image on the plate or pot or you know, as you empty out the jar becomes something different as you use. Are there any descriptions of this happening or just looking at the way that they were designed is that yeah. So if, if they if the these um, Maiolicas invite a di dynamic approach so that by moving it or using it uh, that the, the image reveals itself or opens up new meaning that uh, uh, are become apparent through manipulating it through through using it. I always think of these bowls that would reveal itself when you end <laughs> the soup, right? You don't see what's in it until you've finished drinking your soup. <laughs>
Is that something that you can detect? I mean, people, a, a lot of, of people, well, several people, um, have written saying, talking about the experience, as it were, mm. of spooning down um, into the well of one of these tondinos, what the auction house is called cardinal hat-shaped dishes. Um, I don't really believe it myself. I don't believe that this was a, 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 a deliberate effect that was achieved. Um, I don't think it's like um, one of those 19th century Staffordshire mugs where you um, drink down and there's a frog that emerges <laughs> at the bottom of the mug when you get to the bottom of the beer. Oh, Dora. But surely the relationship with the front and the back, the way that a quotation from Petrarch's Triomphi can amplify an allegory of the sack of Rome, these things are meant to be, if not jokes, then insightful literary comments where you're supposed to see something which looks like it's a love poem is actually about politics when you relate the two things and reconstruct the allegory. So I think there's, there can be very complicated things, quite amusing things, which are supposed to exercise the minds of the cardinals and whoever does it. And the act of turning things over and using them, at presumably as display pieces rather than things you eat of, surely must be part of the appeal of these pieces. I think one of, you know, obviously a very short discussion, you can't pick up the importance of novelty and fashion, the new repertory of ornament, the explosion of print culture, both prints and printed books, that the appeal and the status of the early incunabula, the way the images translate across from woodcuts into brilliantly coloured pigments, and that's one of the things Vasari does say, is that the ancients never painted with the glorious pigments of our own time, the fantastic, glossy surfaces. So the, you know, the technical achievement is an incredibly important thing here, I think, and the coalescing of these different print cultures. Um, there's a moment where those things really wait, and then there's obviously, we all know this, a moment where they don't anymore. And it's when things stop happening that you need to go back and think about how they started. And when you don't understand how something stops, you can go back and understand better how it might have begun. I would suggest that those might be elements. Thank you. Yeah. Very important um, comment. Nicole? Hi, um, thank you for the brilliant presentation. I really enjoyed it. And I was still trying to wrap my, my head around what is my question because I think it's a double question. But it starts with were they aware that these were made of earth, that these were objects made of earth? And does that ever come to the surface in documentary evidence? And I'm asking this question from two perspectives. On the one hand, thinking also in terms of humor, but in a completely different way. So I'm thinking about the humor as, you know, through the element and the moral theory of the human body. And I'm thinking about that because as you kind of explained, some of these jobs were used um, to contain medicaments. And so what was the connection there? If there was any, if there was any, you know, accounts of the period um, kind of discussing and negotiating this idea of um, you know, Earth um, being both the shape of, like, making up the container and the elements contained in that. And this was prompted, um, especially when, um, when he mentioned the letter to uh, Zabanadeste, in which, you know, produce from the land was swapped for these objects. And I understand that it wasn't because that was a manufacturing there that was particularly thriving. But again, was there a connection? Was it understood to be both products? Uh, coming from the earth, but in a different way, but still feeding the body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they do call them vasi di terra. It's always, you know, sort of really from the soil, you know, vases from the soil. It's always seem to be the, the how they, they, they call them. And so, yeah, I'm sure they, they knew, they knew them. That's Inventory right. clerks make usually make a clear distinction in, in the early, early part of the 16th century, at least, between vasi di terra, earthenware, um, porcelana, which I think they could usually recognise, though they probably sometimes mixed it up with isnik, um, and what they called still up to the middle of the 16th century, maiolica, lusterware. So they, 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 there are technical characteristics, but inventory clerks are a rather special breed. I mean, it's their business to understand this stuff. So I don't think you can judge too much from what they knew. Uh, well, certainly, uh, yes, there's another question there. 
And I, I, mean, I was, what we say, I was, in relation to this, I was going to say that um, recently there's been a lot of interest, for instance, in understanding metal work, the, the meaning of metal in metal work. So, uh, how, what was understood the material to mean in itself and how that contributed to create meaning in in the objects made of metal. So perhaps this would be a parallel to what but, we like, call... Like a kind of transforming of the metal. Yes, yeah, the transforming. Of what, what is metal? Noble. Yeah, from something yeah. Base Very curiously, noble. it was considered a watery yeah. material, yeah. metal, because it derived from the congealment of water in under pressure. In This is what pseudo-scientific text say. The, the man who really knew about metal, Venuccio Berenguccio, and his big mm. treatise on yeah. metal published in written in the 1540s, I think, yeah. says, you know, has a, has a long chapter on pottery, and he has a lovely phrase, he says, I don't know if I can do it in Italian, but he says, a maiolica is a mixture of the art of design, arte del disegno, a certe alchemical mistioni, certain mm -hmm. alchemical mm -hmm. mixtures. Mm -hmm. so, so clearly, you know, transformation, and potters now, um, those of you who know, knew, for instance, um, the wonderful potter Alan K.J. Smith, well, who died a few it. years ago, will know that Alan was absolutely thought of himself as a kind of alchemist. You know, this is, this is transformation of a very special sort, and I'm sure potters were, were aware of that. So here, we have, perhaps we have an answer for your question. <laughs> Uh, yes, there was another question there. Closer, closer to the mic here. Why are the colors so bright? Is it to do with like the materials available in southern Europe? And also, was it produced um, anywhere other than the central Italy? Do you see like some Italy? I don't know. These are just. Thank you. So, were there two questions? One is why the colors are so bright, and secondly, were they produced only in Central Italy or also other in other parts of? <laughs> um, the colors. I mean, looking at what we have on the screen, um, the orange is iron. There is yellow from antimony. There is blue from cobalt. There's probably some green from copper, I yes, um, and uh, there is purple and brown from manganese. And those are the colors, basically, um, that were available to potters that would fire at 1100 odd degrees centigrade. They never found a decent red. And the Renaissance. But it's a red there. The book is red. Yeah, but it's all it's all gone. It's all it's gone wrong. wrong. <laughs> so it proves, proves my point. She didn't yeah, meant to have yeah. that sort of sort of pale triangle yeah. on it. Um, <laughs> and as far as as the other question goes, no. I mean, it used to be thought that Maiolica was sort of invented in Faenza in the 15th century and mm. diffused out from there. In fact, artistic Maiolica takes off in a whole series of places: Pesaro, Faenza, um, in and around Florence, in and around Siena, in Deruta, and even a bit in Venice. Um, at the end of the 15th century, and you get um, a whole lot of tropes about how we value these things more than if, if they were gold. Um, but potters moved extraordinarily well. Um, you don't have, for instance, the potter Francesco Durantino in this collection, but he came from Castel Durante, he went and worked in Urbino, from there he went and set up his own business um, in, outside Perugia, that failed, so he ran away from his debtors and went to Rome. He then went to a town called Nazzano, north of Rome. He then went from there to become um, court, to work at the court in Savoy, up in Turin, and then he came down again to Nazzano, where he died, again, I suspect, in debt. So people <laughs> moved around, um, and this was creative. I, um, you were kind enough to mention my Ashmolean book. I uh, think of this, um, Pace, anybody who disagrees with me on the politics of this, as my anti-Brexit book, because <laughs> um, it, the, the theme that I attempted to make run through it was the enormous you know, creative advantage that particularly Northern Europe derived from mm. particularly the times of the wars of religion, the fact that skilled artisans you know, needed to move and they brought their skills 
um, with them. So the, the great industry in Delft was essentially founded by a man from Castel Durante who probably went from Venice, set up in Antwerp, his sons turned Protestant, came over to England, and that's where English Delftware gets invented. So it's all about creative, um, and, highly and skilled and there, you are, and there you are, the cross-cultural <laughs> exchanges that I was mentioning, and, and um, the really transnational I mean, nature of this production. You know, so then you could say the same about glass, I guess, but it's sort of yeah. But also the team, not team, obviously, this is essential for Maioi, for ting glazing, came from Cornwall. Still, sort of the main source was from Cornwall, so that would be impossible now with Brexit. It would be so expensive. <laughs> it would just be too expensive. No, it's because tin, oddly enough, doesn't, doesn't, I think, occur anywhere in Italy, even, even, no, even, no, it even now. So and lead and tin are yeah. the two essential metallic components of the glaze. As, yeah. um, uh, c cobalt is, is, is an expensive thing, uh, yeah. but not as expensive yeah. as lapis lazuli. Yeah. Sorry? There, there is and was tin in Italy. It just wasn't oh. available in sufficient quantities. Okay. It comes from southern Tuscany. Was, oh. it, was it mined? Uh, yes. In the uh, Renaissance? Uh, Georgia, it talks about it. the, hmm. I think Frankovich may have gone on to it first, hmm. Ricardo Frankovich. But the point hmm. is that so we're uh, having some ingredients. If we haven't got any quantity, no. It just doesn't no. count. No. It's so just, sorry, just let me get this straight. Tin was mined commercially in southern Tuscany in the early 16th century. That's absolute news to me and very interesting, if, if, if so. Well, I'm not going to swear to everything. <laughs> <laughs> Subject <laughs> to <laughs> checks. <laughs> uh, I have to say that I've known Hugo for um, over 50 years um, and he and John Mallet, when I disagree with them, very, very annoyingly, I find that I'm almost always wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the quantities of commercial viability. But that's very interesting. Thank you. Yes. Southern Tuscany is a place full of minerals, full of all sorts of products. Yeah. Of the earth. <laughs> but just to confuse matters, um, and to show just how international this stuff is. When Picopasso, in his treatise, which Elisa mentioned in the 1550s, writes about um, the materials, he talks about Flanders tin, because the market was in the hands of uh, merchants from Antwerp who, uh, who marketed the, the tin mined in Cornwall down to Italy and the Mediterranean generally. Yeah. But where was it arriving? Where was the tin arriving? Was it arriving in, in Tuscany? Do we know where tin was arriving? The port or lake? Well, the, uh, so we have to see. You go around. Mm. That's the kind of person you know. The tin being bought in Faenza in the early 16th century comes from a Ragusum, or ah. merchant of Dubrovnik, who lives in Ancona. <laughs> Um, so the, the, the picture you, you're giving <laughs> us uh, that uh, leads to places like Castel Durante or Gubbio, <laughs> tiny little lovely medieval towns. Important emporium then. Later, when Livorno comes established, that's the route. You, you're giving us a picture of international trade that coalesces around this pots and jugs and plates. It's wonderful. I think if there isn't a last burning question, I would close it here and thank very much our guest and the author of this wonderful monumental catalogue, Elisa.